Thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, well, thank you for asking me to come along. Um, I've been asked to, to do a talk like this. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm a portfolio GP or not, really. Um, but I've done, I've done a few things since I qualified as a GP here in Nottingham over the last 15 years. And uh, whilst this talk may seem a little bit about me, really I want you to think this is about you. This is about the possibilities that as a, as a GP, as one of the, you know, one of the, a breed of the most versatile doctors who qualify, you have unfiltered patients. You see whoever comes through the door with whatever kind of problem they have. And that puts you in a unique position to actually broaden your skill base, do whatever you want to do. Because you're not a surgeon seeing these every day or a renal physician seeing that. You, you actually see the whole breadth of things. And so I've had great opportunities over the last 15 years, some of which have just come my way, some of which perhaps I've designed and, 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 and made happen. But just to give you an idea of the sort of possibilities that could await you if you want. So you've qualified. You're a GP, you do medicine. What's it going to be like? Well, you could be doing this for the rest of your professional life, uh, writing prescriptions, keeping up to date with, with medicine, and of course you're going to help a great deal of people in doing so. Um, but this is my sort of timeline, and so I came here in 1996 as a medical student, studied here in, uh, in Nottingham, and then did my training here as well. Um, and during the course of my, my, my training, as you have done I'm sure, just trying to get as many skills as I could. So I did some minor surgery in my GP training, and that's been great, I really enjoyed it. I like getting out of out of my chair and doing something physical uh, and making someone better, taking something off, stitching someone back together again. Um, and tried to get everything out of my hospital jobs as I could. So I did a house job in rheumatology, in GUM, emergency department, orthopedics, PEDS, ONG, and, and some psychiatry. And on the back of that became section 12 approved and, and, and carried on doing minor surgery. Um, but a few more things too. So I'm gonna zoom through some of this. We've got about, I'll try and finish by the time for 20 past uh, three. So um, having got membership and done a couple of diplomas, um, we then moved forward and, and, and I, didn't, I didn't locum for very long, maybe a year or so, and then got a partnership. And I work locally here at the University of Nottingham. That's a Crips Health Centre. So we're a normal NHS practice, but it's on the university campus. Some of you may know it. It's actually probably the biggest practice in the country. Uh, certainly on a single site, there's 42,000 patients, uh, seven partners, and we employ some salaried doctors as well. So a busy little building. At any one time, we're seeing 28 to 30 patients, and we have a similar turnover to the emergency department in terms of numbers of patients. So we're quite busy. That's us. I'm, I don't know if you can see, see me there, I, I'm, I'm sort of laid on the grass over there. <laughs> and uh, halfway up that A is a little picture of me as well. Because the Students' Union got 100 people that have been involved with the university over the last 100 years and, uh, and did a little bit of a little vignette about them. So you'll see some of the things that they, they put in there. So I mentioned minor surgery. And if you've done minor surgery as part of your GP training, tremendously valuable. I mean, it, it, it comes and goes, but I think it's a really nice you know, um, string to your bow, really, because you can do a little bit more and you can avoid referrals and you can have good satisfaction in a job well done. Joint injections, is that popular? Anyone done joint injections? Again, it's a, it's a, it's an, I, I like hands-on medicine. So I did this as part of my rheumatology. I've been to a few update courses over the years as well. And again, you can avoid referrals, you can do more with your patients. And if you get the opportunity, and um, they're quite often run by orthopedic surgeons or the shoulder team or rheumatology, um, it can be a really satisfying and relatively simple thing to do once you know your landmarks and get a bit of confidence. Um, psychiatry. So I did, a, I did a psyche job, and on the back of that, uh, I actually worked with the Nottingham alcohol, alcohol and Drugs team as well for a day a week, so learned a bit of lingo there, I, I, because I, I did feel a bit out of my depth with drugs and alcohol, um, and decided to, to, to do the course and become Section 12 approved. Uh, I don't know if you've thought about that or not. As a GP, of course, you can be asked to be part of a mental health act assessment anyway for your own patients. Um, if you're Section 12 approved, you can go on a rotor and then get called in when someone's own GP isn't available. So you can go and do that same Mental Health Act assessment. It doesn't happen very often. You can do it on call. Uh, you can work for out of hours in, on a rotor. Um, but it's usually a pretty good call when you get, when you get it. And it does give you, a, you know, a, a foot in the door, really, of some of the more significant and, and more serious and more interesting side of psychiatry. So I'd recommend it. 
I enjoy seeing the very young and the very old. So general practice was, uh, was something I really enjoyed. But the variety hasn't stopped there. Okay, what have these got in common? So amongst Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, Rihanna, oh, Eminem, Metallica, Bon Jovi, um, quite a few others, um, I've been involved outside of my GP career in sort of doing some stuff uh, so first aid, essentially first aid, because when I was um, at school, I joined St. John Ambulance just as a volunteer, carried on through medical school, and of course now when you become a doctor, you can do the same sort of thing. So this is just an extra string, really. It's something I can pick up or do a you know, little bit. They, they like a bit of commitment, but actually it means that you can get involved in other things. And actually, whilst you're giving of your own time voluntarily, it's given me a lot back too. It's got me to pop concerts and music festivals. It's got me backstage with uh, various people. Um, it's, uh, it's also does you know, involve me with a bit of sport. So um, the Special Olympics with uh, marathons and half marathons. Um, in the old days at Goose Fair, boxing and things like that. So it's got me outside of my comfort zone, it's fair to say, a bit. Uh, doing a bit of first aid. Again, GPs are good at this. We're good at dealing with people and making decisions without recourse to x-rays and blood tests and things all the time. So you have to think slightly differently, of course, when you're outside, outside of a hospital. So sometimes I'm there wearing my ASDA uniform. Um, and as I say, you work with often you know, enthusiastic volunteers at events, you do training, um, big music festivals, like I said. Um, there's an you may see St John ambulance, ambulances out doing normal ambulance work, EMAS work. Um, and of course we see some quite critically ill people as well. You meet some interesting people and uh, can inv be involved in some quite big events, both locally and, and nationally. Nationally, my regular is the London Marathon, where I'm often the lead physician at Horse Guards Parade, the biggest, the biggest unit, and have, actually as a GP, I have usually four or five A&E consultants working under me. <laughs> Feels a bit strange. So uh, the next thing I th was always interested in was doing a bit of acupuncture. Has anyone else tried or been interested in doing something different like this? I was always fascinated with it. Um, I'd done a bit of judo and martial arts in my time and was all a bit interested in oriental stuff. So I thought, well, why don't I investigate a bit more? And the British Medical Acupuncture Society runs courses all over the country um, every few months. There's a foundation course, which as doctors already, you're allowed to stick needles in people. It just teaches you about you know, how to do it in this particular sense. It doesn't teach you Chinese medicine. It's not about that, but it's teaching you Western medical acupuncture, the evidence base for it, our understanding of the neurophysiology which may be going on. Um, and again, it gives you something else that you can have a go at. Um, so it's been quite interesting. I'll come to that in a minute. So with the acupuncture, since 2004, myself and another partner in the practice were doing it within the practice for our own patients for quite a while. Um, not with complete success. Most of the big studies show that about two-thirds of people benefit from acupuncture for, for, for pain. There's other indications as well, but pain has the strongest evidence. So a third of people aren't necessarily going to benefit, but some are quite significantly helped. And you can reduce medicines, you can reduce referrals. And now we actually see patients from other practices as part of a local enhanced service. So the pain clinic people are referred into us and we see them as well. So it's, it's been quite an interesting thing and, and, and earned money for the practice too. And then I did some sports medicine. So this was a two or three years of a, a long distance diploma really um, from the University of Bath uh, under the British Association of Sport and Exercise Medicine. Again, I'd always been interested in a bit of sport um, and this was born really from doing my A&E attachment. And I remember seeing someone with a sprained ankle. Um, you've seen loads of people with a sprained ankle. Um, lady in her mid thirties and barn door sprained ankle. And she said, you know, how can I, how can I get better after this? And I said, well, rest, ice, compression, elevation, take some ibuprofen, um, give it a few weeks. And she said, no, no, no I, I'm, a, I'm a triathlete. I'm competing in Portugal in two weeks' time. How can I optimise my recovery to get myself ready for this race? And I felt completely out of my depth. I didn't really know how I can advise an athlete or someone just physically active how to optimise that. And so, oh, that's, that's the acupuncture. Um, there we are. So, so th thus was born my interest in sports medicine and wanted to be able to give more to people. Now, I don't know if you know much about the, um, 
is a diploma that you can do in sports medicine. Um, but I went to the University of Bath. Nottingham itself is a centre of excellence in sports medicine, and they teach a master's um, over at Queen's. And that's to doctors and physios. And I initially thought, as most of you probably think, it's all about sports injuries. Um, but it's a whole lot more than that. Um, for two or three years, uh, as a distance thing, so I was working full time, um, I did a, you, they send you stuff to do, there's a whole online learning modules as well, and then there's some residential courses and weekends. Um, we relearned our anatomy. It was all about uh, learning how the, how the way the physios learn anatomy, really, not the Leonardo da Vinci kind of body which doesn't move, but the, the, all the mechanics. And all of a sudden, I understood physiotherapy letters. You learn about the biomechanics, which is a bit dry, but actually when you've got it, it makes a huge difference. Um, going back, it goes back to exercise physiology, about competition, about the psychology of sport, uh, winning and losing and taking part, drugs and, and doping, which as a university GP, you know, we have a lot of physically active people, several of which are GB athletes. It's important. Some very interesting nutrition, rehab, examination, practical skills and emergency medicine. So that all came together after two or three years in a diploma. And you get to meet some more interesting people. So um, I found myself sitting as the doctor at Wimbledon. This actually was a St John Ambulance doctor as well, because St John Ambulance covers the championships and uh, gets you some interesting views. <laughs> and some motorsport. Now, I don't know how much of you know about motorbikes. I'm not an expert at motorsport. But you might realise that back tyre shouldn't really be there. <laughs> now, I was sat for sort of six hours on this particular corner, probably about this far away from the track, um, when this happened to Maxime Berger. Um, so it should really be a little bit closer. This, of course, didn't mean his bike didn't work quite so well. <laughs> um, it completely sheared off. Fortunately, he wasn't seriously injured. Um, but this is at Donington Racetrack, and so it's just another thing that actually you can get involved with. Um, uh, and a lot of doctors who've maybe worked in casualty have, have, have you know, maybe said, well, come along and, and jo join us for a day. Um, actually, I mean, they, they, these, these riders are covered. In, they're they're, they're armoured, really. They've got armadillo kind of covers all over. Uh, the most serious injury I had was someone who'd um, been thrown probably 20, 30 metres, spun off a... Uh, and, it was crazy, and, and we thought he'd probably broken his pelvis. He was in such a degree of pain. It wasn't that. He'd scooted along the ground feet first, and he just got a huge wedgie. <sighs> anyway, that was there. So what do we do next? So quite busy so far. That was 2006. Um, Everest Marathon. So I've got an interest in sports medicine. I've been doing marathon cover with St. John Ambulance. I'd heard of this, um, and all of a sudden I got an email uh, from someone who'd, uh, it was a contact of someone in the sports medicine community saying, would you like to be the chief medical officer for the Everest Marathon, which is exactly what it says. It's a marathon um, in Nepal from Everest Base Camp. Um, Everest Base Camp down, not up, I have to say. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> um, well, it sounds very interesting, but chief medical officer, maybe I'll be part of the team if I can get some time off work. Um, but no, they wanted a chief medical officer, and they were looking for a GP. Not an orthopaedic specialist, not a sports medicine consultant. Someone who, again, who's, um, who, who, who doesn't rely on tests too much. They've got an experience of a lot of hospital doctors, and actually they prefer GPs because of your breadth of experience. And 90% of the work is looking after people, fairly common things, psychology, uh, 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 for people outside their comfort zone. So I'm going to give you a whistle-top store tour of a, of a month in Nepal. Uh, there we go, that's where Nepal is, that's Everest. So my, my brief really, and I had about a, a year to prepare for this, was to recruit, brief and lead a medical team of volunteers for the Everest Marathon um, to resource um, and control all medical supplies. That's because um, we were trying to, this is a fundraising mission. Uh, there was no budget really, although they give me a little bit to buy what we might need to support 150 people in Nepal in, you know, in the, some of the remotest parts of, uh, of the world in extremes of temperature um, and to do something quite as stupid as run a marathon. Um, so we had 90 people, 90 athletes from countries worldwide and about 60 porters, yak herders, cooks, uh, mountain guides and a month of camping in quite extreme climate <coughs> at obviously considerable altitude. Um, now, I'd been there as a tourist before in 2003, so I'd kind of been there before and, and quite enjoyed the atmosphere. Um, and so my challenge was, okay, now I've got to get a medical team together. Who do I choose? How do I go about that? 
So this is the Motley crew that we, that we got in the end. You can see me there. So we've got Bill on this end. So Bill had just retired as a GP um, and uh, loved walking. Had been up Kilimanjaro many times, done quite a lot of expedition medicine, done the, China, the Wall of China, and knew Everest Park quite well. So he was a really solid rock. He was fantastic. Judy, another GP from Derby. Her specialism was palliative care, which I hope not to tap into <laughs> on our expedition. But her credentials really for doing an expedition was having spent three months in the, board, in the jungles of Borneo uh, doing, uh, doing Operation Rally. Um, and then we've got uh, uh, John, who's a sports medicine consultant, um, and he'd been up Kilimanjaro and got some altitude experience as well. Sarah, an emergency medicine trainee who was the next year going to be one of the Everest doctors. You've probably seen them on telly. Um, and Claire at the far end, um, who's a G-grade nurse, who'd spent some time with um, Médecins Sans Frontières in, in Darfur. So again, all have got some uh, sort of expedition experience. And that's my back room trying to pack some kit together. But as I said, I had no budget, really, so I got a bit desperate raising some funds. Any which way I could, really. There we go. Um, but in the end, we were off. And, um, and just to show you a, a few little pictures of a beautiful, beautiful country, quite poverty-stricken, um, still uh, fearing attacks from, from guerrillas. Um, and this is, this is a, a very poor Nepalese soldier. And then they've got the quite rich, relatively speaking, Gurkhas and the British Army. Some young kids on, in their school uniform. Yeah, and that's not from a cartoon. That really is what you and the yaks walk over. Sometimes it's a good deal higher than that. In fact, they've built another one way above this one now, which is much longer. Spectacular scenery. Um, really quite warm during the day, but as soon as it gets about past three, half past three in the afternoon, um, the sun, you, you're in the shade, and, and temperature plummets, so it's really quite cold. So this is the green bit, and you get further north and, uh, and, 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 and uh, go up a bit higher, and uh, you lose all the greenery, and it's all very stark. And so that's our encampment. We can do a ward round once or twice a day, make sure the blisters are okay. Try desperately not to, to stop people getting gastroenteritis and coughing over each other and uh, practicing our drills. So this is just practicing. So I had to go into casualty and I just learned how to plaster for a day. And this is a lightweight cast thinking, well, we are on our own up here. The only way in and out, so there's no roads. It's in and out uh, either on a back of a, you know, a yak or a donkey. Uh, and there's a few places you can land a helicopter, but basically it was us and that was it. Uh, and that was us doing it for real on a Gurkha officer who uh, sprained her ankle after a six mile run and then carried on running for another six miles, such as their toughness. Fortunately, she could ride, so we had to get up. You can see we are in a settlement there, not in the middle of nowhere, so we could put her on the back of a horse, and she was able to get down to the next place where we could fly her out. And some people got quite sick. And that's a picture of me looking down on Everest Base Camp. Um, and I'm about the height of Kilimanjaro there, but the summit of Kilimanjaro, looking down on Base Camp and looking up at Everest. Would anyone like to hazard a guess what my O2 sats are in that picture? 89? 80, 82, 60. You've seen this talk before. <laughs> As you can see that, 67. Yeah. Isn't it amazing the human body can adapt to this? You know, I've, you know, so 67. And I've got a lovely trace actually of my pulse rate going up and the, and the sats going down and it's sort of, uh, with altitude. There we go. And so we saw, we saw a few cases of acute mountain sickness. I'm not going to go through the medicine of this. Uh, uh, high altitude cerebral edema, um, which you can get if you ascend too quickly or overexert yourself. Um, didn't have any death, fortunately, but we did see someone we needed to repatriate uh, in a helicopter. Um, and this is the Gamov bag, the hyperbaric chamber, very claustrophobic, but a way you can reproduce, ex you know, sort of going, you know, descending, uh, more, more pressure. And you can put someone in there with oxygen and lots of uh, sleeping bags to keep them warm and get them down the mountain very quickly if you need to. There we are, I don't need to talk about those. And that was someone we were sending back down, down to Kathmandu. And then we have the, the, the race day. The race day was the easy bit. You're going from very high to much, much lower. The oxygen's getting thicker. And um, as people went down, they got it back into their comfort zone again and had a great day. So that was the Everest Marathon. But we're not quite finished yet. I don't know what the time is. Are we doing all right? Oh, six minutes. OK, right. London Olympics. So I've done a bit of sports medicine. Interested in martial arts, like I told you before. So this is sort of applied to be one of the volunteers. I don't know if any of you are, you are volunteers as well. Any, any volunteers for the London Olympics? I did get asked to go to Rio, but I didn't really... 
I had to pay for it all myself, so I didn't go. But the London Olympics was quite exciting. That was me at the fencing arena. So we had fencing to start off with. I don't know if you remember the London 2012 Olympics with fencing. We didn't do very well. The Italians do best at this. I hadn't really realised with fencing. The, the ultimate skill is not only to, of course, get your opponent. What you've then got to do is take off your helmet, shake your hair around and go, yes. And the first one to do that it gets the point. I think the Italians are very good. There we are. That's Richard Cruz getting beaten. And that's us treating them. And after the fencing was the Taekwondo. So again, I was particularly interested in the Taekwondo. Um, been doing karate and judo for a few years. I thought this would be all great. And it looks pretty violent and nasty, but injuries are fairly few, to be fair. Do you recognise the lady in blue? Jade. She went on to get gold medal. But of course she couldn't have done it, could she really, without her medical team? <laughs> there we go. OK, we're getting closer now. So, uh, so this is... So as you can see, I quite enjoy some emergency medicine. We're all pre-hospital doctors, aren't we? So this is, this is so out of hospital, pre-hospital care is what we're good at. Um, and I've been doing St John Ambulance for a while. Anyone heard of BASICS, the British Association of Immediate Care Schemes? So this was born, this volunteer doctors, it's a charity, uh, born I think probably in the ruralities of Scotland, uh, where actually you can take a long time for an ambulance to get from a hospital or ambulance station out to a cardiac arrest or an accident. Whereas of course GPs live everywhere. So if you're a GP and you've got some kit and there's someone having a heart attack in the street behind or the next village, you could get there a lot quicker than the ambulance. And so this has expanded to schemes all over the country. And so I'm a volunteer, have been for a few years with, with Basics. Um, we train ourselves. So you go on a pre-hospital emergency care course run by Basics. Um, and if you join the East Midlands scheme, as with many others, you have an honorary contract with the ambulance service and you're skilled, they give you some equipment and uh, then you've got a defibrillator, you've got oxygen, you've got emergency drugs, and you can be on call. You also, of course, need to be able to drive safely very fast, and they put you through the training for blue light training, the same as the police and the, and the fire and the ambulance. And so that gets you around a little bit. Um, you get called to road traffic accidents. I get called out once or twice a week on average, so 100, 120 times a year, um, and you tend to get called to the most you know, scary stuff, really. Um, and so it's, it's life-threatening by definition, really, because otherwise, and the ambulance is, you're not on your own, the ambulance is always backing you up. Sometimes you're there first, sometimes the ambulance is there first. Um, and I can think back over the last sort of five, six years of working with, a, with, with the Helimed chaps, um, in the, you know, working at night, working during the day, and it's very re rewarding. Most of the time, I'm not doing anything particularly clever. Most of the time, I'm there having a reassuring face to the paramedics, but I'm just another pair of hands stepping back a little bit, have you thought about this, what are we going to do next? And occasionally, you have to bring a few other skills to bear. So uh, look out if you see me in your rear view mirror. Um, and uh, it's basic principles, it's, it, it, it's your ABCs, it's your ABC, it's your basic bits and bobs, and occasionally you get called in to do something a little bit more um, definitive, I suppose, uh, or surgical, be it a surgical airway, be it thoracostomies, um, amputation, thankfully I haven't had to do that, or, uh, or the, the most significant thing I've been called to do a couple of times is a, is a clamshell thoracotomy for someone who's been stabbed in the chest, um, which is pretty big stuff really, but uh, so there's some training to support you in that sort of thing. So interesting and, uh, and rewarding. There we go. Right, we're getting towards the end there. If you want any details about eMix, there's a website here, and, and you're very welcome. I can pass this on to you. OK. A really rewarding part is getting to meet the family afterwards. This has happened on a few occasions when you make quite a difference. This is a young chap who got run over in West Bridgeford after a bit of a drunk night out um, and had a chest injury and a head injury. He was very combative. Uh, and so uh, working with the paramedics, we've got a decent airway. And I gave him sedation with ketamine and midazolam, um, did a couple of chest decompressions, and we got him into hospital very quickly. And he had a really good outcome, sat his exams on time, and did very well. Um, so what was next? Well, I had all those adventures, and the next adventure was to be the best and the biggest. Not before time, probably. And so that was all great. And uh, a fellowship in 2016. And, uh, and so that's where it's been. He's, he's three now. And uh, the next adventure happens in five weeks. <laughs> so in summary, 
this is about this is a bit, a bit about me. It's a bit of nostalgia for me. But I think the biggest message I've got is you are the most versatile doctors are. On the planet, you can do all sorts of different things. Look for opportunities. Enjoy you what you do. Keep yourself healthy and take every opportunity to do what you enjoy. Thanks very much. That was working. I think we've probably got time to take a few questions for you from the okay. floor. Um, if anyone has any questions, that's it. Mm. Yeah, it's a question back. Oh, yes, okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, the e things that you were talking about last at the end. Yes. The, um, is, it, is it just purely um, run of volunteers? It is, yeah. So, so, um, yeah. so we're all volunteers. About half of us, and there are about 25 of us in the East Midlands, are probably GPs. And the others are a mixture of anaesthetics and ED. Um, a, few, a few are GPs who also work on the helicopter. Um, if you're on a helicopter, you need to be able to anaesthetise. I, I, I can't do a rapid sequence induction and never will be able to, really, uh, and be medically indemnified for that. So I'm not likely to be flying in a big yellow machine. Um, they are paid. They do get some money for working on the air ambulance. But most of us doing the... the, the it's a similar job. You're just in a car, really. Um, but say with a land version of that, and that's voluntary. And, and with that um, honorary contract that you have, um, are you able to kind of um, reduce kind of what you do, or kind of increase it depending on your availability? So, so, so that's entirely up to me, really. Um, there is a there's a there's a bottom line. You're expected to, to respond um, when the ambulance service call you, but it's entirely up to me whether or not I sign in or not. So, um, if I had a glass of wine, I'm not going to. If I'm looking after a little three-year-old, I'm not going to. But if it's all quiet and I'm available and I could respond, then I just send a text message to the computer-aided dispatch. They know I'm on the sack and ready to, to respond. Uh, I've got an airwave radio, so they can contact me by phone or by radio. And, uh, you know, obviously I, I respond quickly. I think they ask you to respond to, I think, up two a month, two emergencies a month is the minimum. Um, and there's plenty of work. Minor ops, and I can like doing independent lists by myself at my current surgery. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to be doping for a bit because I'm moving to a new area before I do salary post. So I might not get the opportunity to keep my skills up to date. Is there anything you can suggest in the meantime so I don't lose out on that? So I prefer to keep it going long term. Um. Yes, I've been quite lucky, just, I think, just because we've got a rolling list of, of people, so there's stuff coming along all the time. Um, but there are update courses, so I think, I think it's some of that. Probably, I don't know if there are any stipulated requirements that you have to requalify or do things every few years. But I think if I was in your position, uh, in the same way with the joint injections, if you're feeling a bit rusty, then, then I think it's good CPD to go on an update course. And I saw one advertised last week, but I can't remember where it was. So they do, they, they, they're run sometimes by the RCGP, sometimes by other local interested people. Thank you. Um, so, with, with regards to the sports medicine type things and mm. attending at, at um, boxing matches and Olympics and this sort of things, how did you come across these uh, type of opportunities? Did you sort of fall, fall upon them? Did you seek them out and just email them into the like, I'm, I'm a doctor, I really want to help? It's, uh, yeah, um, most of what I've done in terms of touchline stuff, I mean, we saw the Olympics there, has been through St. John Ambulance, because, so again, it's been as a volunteer outside medical practice, where, where, uh, where I use a lot of the, the, the knowledge gained through the sports medicine diploma, or masters, is in practice, so our, um, people will be directed to me if they've got a sports injury within the practice, uh, and other doctors in the practice, if they're about to make a referral or they're not quite sure, if it's barned or orthopaedics, of course, they'll do a referral, but quite often you get a lot of cases where the foot's still sore, the knees, and they just want a bit more of an expert opinion. And very often, with a good sports physician and some good physio uh, and, and some good you know, other services, you can, you can sort a lot out. It's very satisfying, I have to say. The examination skills I learned doing the sports medicine um, have really, really helped. 
Um, I've discovered a whole load of conditions that I never knew existed before, and it's really satisfying to diagnose them and give someone a definitive rehab schedule, which you can just print off and give them and talk them through. So it's been very rewarding to do that. So, 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 so the answer to your question is that I think St John Ambulance gave me some of the touchline experience and opportunities, and you find out what's happening and what's going on. Um, but the, the, the clinic experience really comes from the practice. Thanks very much. Oh, one more. With your um, sort of volunteer stuff or, or outside of clinical practice stuff, how do you um, liaise that with your regular clinical practice, i.e. if you were called out in the middle of the night with your um, sort of examining what uh, happens to Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so I have to be quite careful with that. So that's a very good question. Um, basically, I don't put myself on call um, really past midnight if I've got to work the next day. Um, so, so, so it depends what I'm doing really, it depends on your own family life and we're all volunteers and the ambulance control know that um, so we just sign on when we want to but I'll sign on in an evening and then sign off if I've got to work the next day so that I'm not too tired and I've had a, a night's sleep um, so Friday night, Saturday night, fine, I can sign on and do, yeah, do, do some work one more question if there is one if not, then we'll, we'll I just wanted to ask how your um, indemnity stuff works with, with the volunteering it's, it's, so I'm with the MPS and it's been quite straightforward um, I've just needed to tell them what I'm doing I'm not outside my scope of practice I, I, I've, uh, I don't pay any extra for the, for, for, for the sports medicine or the volunteering um, because I'm not doing anything well you see, I, I suppose with the ambulance work the ambulances are all running as well and you're just providing a bit of extra skill I suppose or a bit of extra experience um, and, uh, and I've not had to pay any premiums for that, really. It's more likely to happen with sports medicine, I would think, if you're looking after a team. I think if you're doing anything professional, then it can whack up very high very quickly. But I've not chosen to do that. I think I value my... It seems silly. I've, if you're working with a team, I think very often your weekends and evenings are taken up with tours, with seeing them, with doing a lot of that, and, and, and the, the chances of having a claim against you are much, much higher. Is it, is it crown indemnity, Tim, when you're operating... With, you know, with the paramedics. With the paramedics. It, it is. is. It is. It is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank well, you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Thank you.